Okay, everybody, uh, thanks for joining and welcome to the Big Picture Outlook. And we are here to look at dun, 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 kind of the bigger picture. I mean, I think uh, this is a good time to look at it. I think a lot of people are kind of freaking out a little bit um, with, you know, banking failures and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this over here to a monthly chart that kind of gives us a little bit of a bigger picture, uh, kind of an outlook on, on what to look at, right? And then over here, we'll look at a daily chart. So again, we got the monthly chart over here. We've got the daily chart over here. And up here, this is really more for intraday trading and things like that. And it's just, you can not, you, I'm looking at it for information, but not necessarily a part of this. And I, I guess the first thing I want to, we'll come, well, let's start off with Microsoft, but I want to, and I want to come back and we'll kind of look at the big picture and stuff like that. But one of the things we want to kind of keep in mind is that while the, uh, you know, it's easy to get, um, you know, really kind of wrapped into a lot of, you know, the despair and the fear, especially over the last couple of weeks with banks failing. It's like, oh my God, is this 2008 all over again? It's always important to kind of dial it back because guess what? Fear sells. Not only does fear sells in the news, which is why they peddle that crap all the time, but fear sells in all kinds of newsletters all around the world. And um, I get, you know, from whether it's, uh, I don't, I don't want to name names since I'm recording this, but you know, there's the same players that come out every time there's some bad news, and it's like, this is the end of the world, get your gold, get your spam, get your bullets, you know, the world's going to go to hell. And, you know, I, I've been hearing this since Y2K, and I've read, you know, biographies and autobiographies of people who've been hearing this since 1850, right, and before that. So just know that that's always in the backdrop. So we do not want to be scared, but we do want to be prepared. So that being said, what is happening? You know, what is happening? So the first thing I just want to point out on this monthly chart of Microsoft, okay? This is a monthly squeeze. The monthly squeeze happens every four or five years. And when it does fire, you typically are going to get the most powerful uptrend that you've ever traded in your life. And you don't even need to know that the, you know, that the monthly squeeze is fired. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to buy the dip every day on something like this. So I want to point out here that there's a huge monthly squeeze setting up. And this is the first time that Microsoft on the monthly chart has been red uh, since like, I don't know, was that since 2000, since 2008. Of course, you know, it's hard to see all that right now. So I want to point out a couple of things on Microsoft. You know, first of all, you know, we had this fantastic rally and this pullback, and this pullback is pretty normal. And now it's breaking out, and the histogram, which has been going down for about a year and three or four months, has now just turned higher. Okay, so it's very possible here that Microsoft is uh, on the verge of a, of, of a pretty significant move higher. Now, does that mean that the markets themselves, okay, are on the verge of a significant move higher. In the short term, in the short term, believe it or not, I know it's crazy because it's like, oh my gosh, banks are going under. Shouldn't the market be dying here? And then and, and here we are, we're up, you know, the S and P's are up forty four points. I I don't think that the well I I'm trying to think where to start. Where's the best way to start here? First, let's look at this. So same thing here. The the monthly squeeze here, the, the we've been falling for a year. We just turned up. We just turned up. It's possible that this could even fire along. I guess the main thing I want to be clear about is I, I, do n I am not advocating, nor am I looking for, a stock market that's going to resume its uptrend. Okay? Um, I, don't, I don't think we're going to see this. You know, we'd have to get into back into with, you know, ma massive quantitative easing and stuff like that, too. And, and I don't, I don't, that's not really not on the table. Um, but bigger picture is that you know this this was where capitulation happened, and now we're hanging out here. Okay, and this is kind of a you know it's on the one hand it's a head and shoulders reversal that's happening, and on the other hand it's kind of a bear flag. Um, but what I'm watching here is that this thing is trying to rotate higher. Ultimately, though, I do think that the S and P's are going to be trading in a range uh, like this for much of the year. So that we could pop up through the upper part of this range. I think later in the year we're going to pop up through the lower part of this range. Uh, but I'm not looking for a 2008 style move. Now, what does 2008 look like? Let's come back here and look at 2008. Um, now, remember, this is a monthly chart. You know, 2008, we went from 1600 to 800. It dropped 50%. We took out the 200 SMA. Okay, um, it, it looked like the end of the world. I mean, it was pretty bad. It was it was pretty it was pretty crazy. 
So remember, so remember that, and let's go back to go back to here. All we've done is pull back to like the 55 period moving average, even with all the bad news that we've seen. Okay, it doesn't mean it can't get worse, but again, if we kind of go back here and we and we look at 2008 and the buildup here, you know, it got kind of kind of sketchy, and then you know, um, you know, so the argument I've heard is that well, you know, right right now or right here. And because it looks similar to 2008, that means we're going to do this. That is the best way on planet Earth to lose all your money, is to take what's happening today and overlay it on a chart from the past. Okay, They do not relate in any way, shape, or form, because it's totally different circumstances. All right, so that being said, big picture, what are, you know, what are we looking at here? So I'm a big advocate of what I would simply call, um, if you guys have heard this theory before, I certainly have talked about it quite a bit. Back in 2004, I was doing a talk in London and met a guy named Philip Anderson. He wrote this book called, he was given a talk, he wrote this book called The Secret Life of Banking and Real Estate. And I was intrigued and we started a talk and here we are in 2004 and he's explaining to me in painstaking detail why and how we're going to have a housing crash starting in 2008. And and I was kind of like, uh huh, right? Yeah, we're in a pub, we're drinking a beer, and I'm just like, yeah, okay, this guy's crazy. Um, you know, I didn't really, I, was, I didn't really what he was talking about. And of course, 2008 played out, and we kept in touch. And the cycle he's talking about is a cycle that's happened every 18 and a half years, give or take, um, over the course of the last 200 years, and it's all based on the banking cycle and the thirst. Uh, for the Western economies to capitalize land, to monetize land. Okay, so what does all that mean? What that means is, is that according to his calculations, which I believe, is that we're not going to really see um, a 2008 until about mid-2026. So think of 2026 to 2028, okay, as similar to maybe 2008 to 2010. So that's kind of the first thing. And and in fact, I've even talked to him recently and he's kind of laughing. He's like, "Man, all this fear that's coming out about, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, it's such a joke." You know, he's you know, that's that's a that's that has nothing to do, you know, with any of this. That's a that's an isolated incident where these guys were all focused on venture capitalists. They wouldn't let people, you know, bank anywhere else, and it has nothing to do with any of this stuff. And the stuff that he talks about is things like, you know, in January, the Fed approved a $1.2 trillion infrastructure package. This is stuff that's happening now. There's a $77 billion train going to be going up in California. Um, that's, you know, 8% uh, of the funds. And all these funds, all this infrastructure is going to be put into use into, you know, into land. And it's going to cause the real estate around those areas to go up. People are going to get speculative again. And guess what? Banks are going to get loose on mortgages again. So, so bigger picture, this is a slight pause uh, before kind of the last ramp up in real estate and land speculation into 2026. Now, how does that equate to stocks? That does not necessarily equate to stocks exactly. Okay, stocks. Uh, so the first thing is, is that is this going to be, is, are, is 2008 upon us? The answer is, I think absolutely not in any way, shape, or form, but I do think in three or four years from now, we are going to come across that, and great, we'll, we'll deal with it then. So then the next question is, well, what about what's happening, you know, what's, what about what's happening um, here? Yeah, 2.12 miles. Um, well, so now, I mean, really right now, we're kind of in a muddle through. So when I look at the stock market here, I, I look at something, it reminds me of, now I've had people say that, you know, you should look at like 19... 73, you know, 75, 76, 77, 78, where the stock market did nothing because of what? Inflation. And so I think that's the next thing we want to talk about here is inflation. And and this is, you know, and, and this is an area where, you know, I certainly have studied this a lot, but I, I didn't, you know, when I was in the 1970s, I, I, was a, I was a kid, right? I didn't experience that firsthand. So some of it's more anecdotal, some of it's based on talking to people and things like that too, and some of it's based on observations. So the main thing I wanted to point out about inflation is that when we were, um, peak inflation is, you know, wrapped up here, okay? When oil hit $120 a barrel, give or take, since then it's been coming down. So, um, so there's, you know, oil hitting $120 a barrel, let's look at, you know, a grain, wheat, Okay, wheat, dear Lord, you know, oh my gosh, wheat spiked up. Um, natural gas, 
Okay, you think there's still an inflation problem in natural gas? Um, you know, this thing is it's still rolling over. And so this is the kind of thing where, yeah, right here it was really, really scary. And then guess what happens? All these prices essentially get stretched into the economy, stretched into people's bills for a long time. It takes a long time for inflation to show itself, and it takes a long time for inflation to kind of calm down. I, believe it or not, don't actually think we're going to be going to a period of time where inflation is back to 2% anytime soon. I think that we're going to drop to 4 to 5%. And that'll be kind of a new normal, um, but I see you know reports of oh my God hyperinflation's around the corner, and I, I just I think that's fear mongering. I don't I don't think we're in that at all. You know the classic case of uh, a couple of classic cases of hyperinflation, but let's talk about Zimbabwe. So in Zimbabwe, how did they get inflation of eighty thousand percent a year? Well, they kicked out all of the foreign entrepreneurs. So whoever it was that took power, I forgot, cooked out all the foreign entrepreneurs, gave these large businesses to his cronies, and they ran them into the ground. Guess what? Nobody had faith in the currency anymore because unemployment went to 35%. That's what you get hyperinflation. Um, so that's that's the kind of stuff that where where you know where you get an extreme example like that. And it's just important to understand. All right. So natural gas, um, and then there's the dollar. You know, the U.S. dollar. You know, oh my God, is the U.S. dollar, is, is that going to get replaced as a reserve currency? You know, no. As long as the U.S. controls the sea lanes, it's going to be the reserve currency. Now, is that going to go away, you know, soon? It, it could certainly, you know, empires come and go. I don't think that's something we're going to see in our lifetime. Obviously, you know, um, other countries around the world, you know, want to want to have a bigger role in things and want to displace the U.S. And, and that's that's fine. That's how, you know, that's war, that's politics, that's a fact of life. Um, but in the meantime, it's not anything that's a concern front and center. I mean, again, I've, I've heard this throughout my entire financial career, how the dollar is about to be replaced by the yuan or, or whatever. Uh, at the end of the day, politics is one thing, but people want to do business in, um, you know, they want to they trust that the they want to trust the other side of the transaction, right? So the dollar here, a uh, huge move. Again, huge move here. This is representative of the fastest fiscal tightening in history. So you have not only the dollar going up, um, when the dollar is going up, it does constrict economies that borrow money in dollars in for, in foreign currencies. So, you know, if you're if you got a mortgage in dollars or you got debt in dollars in South Africa, and the dollar gets much stronger against the rand, right? You need more and more rand every month to pay off that monthly payment. That's very real. Um, the dollar at a dollar fifteen can cause a global recession for that reason. So you had the dollar exploding up, you had wheat and oil and natural gas exploding up, and you had interest rates all going up at the same time. That's never happened before where all three went up that quickly, you know, that fast. And that is what flooded the system and and you know, and businesses use that, hey, we've got to raise our prices and stuff like that too. And none of that's coming down. Um, none of the, you know, if, if, if Chipotle's raise their prices, guess what? They're not going to lower them. But now we got a situation where the dollar is at, a, is at 102, right? It's, it's not up here. It's not accelerating. And it's just going to take a while, you know, for this to get through the system. So the short, the, lo the short version of all this is that inflation, I think, has peaked. Um, we are not in a 2008 situation because we're going to see, believe it or not, a new bull market in construction um, and land exp and land development, and that's going to go back into real estate. Um, but and it's like, well, gosh, what about these sky high interest rates? Oh my gosh! Well, they're sky high because we're used to two and a half percent mortgages. You know, that's why they seem like they're sky high, right? But they're not sky high. They're very reasonable. And if we come over here and we look at a monthly chart of rates. Um, you can see, yeah, they've certainly come up off the lows, but if we look at this, I mean, you know, for most, I, you know, this is back, uh, they're, they're at the same level uh, that they were, um, you know, and back here, you know, this is, remember, this is the 10-year note. Uh, the 10-year note here was at 6%, okay? That means that mortgages were 9%. So we've just kind of reverted back to the mean. It's not the end of the world. Um, you know, I don't see that more. You know, it, I don't see the ten-year note rate spiking much beyond where we are now, and in fact, kind of leveling off. So, is this something that's going to put some industries out of business? Yes. Uh, is this something that hurt uh, Silicon Valley Bank? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, why? You know, why did it hurt Sil uh, Silicon Valley Bank? Because, you know, what they did is they decided to 
Um, look, you know what? Gosh, we've got all these deposits. Let's put them all into bonds. This is what they mean by mark to market. And, you know, bonds have been destroyed. And, you know, if they would hold them to maturity, they would get all their money back. But if you mark to market, that's a huge loss. And so that's essentially, you know, you're looking at the books going like, uh, you kind of have a huge loss here. And so that's that's what's kind of thrown them all off. And so it was bad timing. You would think that somebody that worked in the financial industry would understand that when the Fed says they're going to raise rates, then buying bonds is the worst idea on planet Earth. But, you know, who knows? Maybe they missed that. Maybe they missed that class in school when they decided to be a bankers. Um Yeah, so no, so it's a good question. So this is a big debate. Well, interest rates are going up, right? Mortgages are going up. That means houses have to crash. Well, interest rates do not um, directly impact real estate. What it, what impacts real estate? The number one thing that impacts real estate is the supply of homes for sale. And I don't know about you guys, it's different in different markets, but the supply of homes for sale has not exploded. And for a fair market, you need four to six months of supply on the market. You know, in Austin, it's like three months. It's like, it's not, you know, so that's the, interest rates can go to 18%, but if the supply of homes on the market is two months, home prices aren't going down. And you got to remember, there's a lot of cash buyers out there. There's a lot of, comp you know, there's a lot of hedge funds that have been buying homes. And so this, this, this idea that because interest rates are going up, the housing market is going to crash is a, is a fallacy. It used to be true before you had all these cash buyers and before you had all these hedge funds coming into the market. But that's the only thing that drives housing prices down is excess supply. If you get over six months supply of homes and especially over nine months supply of homes on the market, yes, you are going to see prices come down drastically. So just kind of keep that in mind. That's uh, it's um, you know, it's it's easy to kind of the other thing to remember too is if somebody owns a home and they've locked locked in a 30-year fixed mortgage at 2.8%, uh, they're going to think twice about selling that home to upgrade to a slightly bigger home with a 7% mortgage, right? Guess what? That's less supply. So you got a couple couple things like that. So, yeah, and you can believe whatever you want, but that's just the facts. You know, you can you look if you look at real estate prices right side out at your window, nothing, you know, nothing's falling at the moment. Um, and there's so many cash buyers, and I think that's one thing that the you know the, this is the new for the markets. There's so many cash buyers. Real interest rates don't matter. Like for a lot of buyers out there, interest rates are irrelevant because they're not getting a mortgage. So a couple things like that. But I, I hear your point. Um, okay. So so that's bonds. All right. So so here's the toughest thing right now. I I'm actually kind of a closet bear because I always look for um, the ability of institutions to screw things up so things take a nosedive and uh, I was very much into that in 2008 and the thing I, r I remember about 2008 I actually went to Iceland to visit what a cluster that was in 2008 and I was buying silver and I was buying gold let's look at gold by the way and the biggest thing I remember is in the height of all that is and you know in the mortgage in the you know the banking sector almost collapsed guess what you know they're not gonna let it collapse and in the height of all that I'd go to the movies and they were packed. I'd go to Walmart and it was packed. And people kind of forget that just because a banking institution implodes um, or because real estate implodes, it doesn't, it affects people, but it doesn't affect, there's a large part of the population that could care less. You know, they're renting a home, you know, they're working, um, all that kind of stuff too. And, and I get it. I mean, if we get to 30% unemployment, that can change. But, um, there's a much smaller portion of the world, you know, the U.S., that's got, you know, if real estate prices go down 30%, that their net worth gets impacted by that, right? Most people could care less, and it's not going to impact their life. And so that's why the one thing I was always surprised in 2008 is that I'd go out and people were, yeah, I was like, oh, I lost my job, I found a new one, I, you know, we lost, we, I, this investment property, we, had, we lost, you know, we had to dump it, and, you know, we, we moved in with some friends, but, you know, they figure out a way. Um... So it's always important to kind of keep in mind that there's not 8 billion people sitting around the world hoping that real estate prices, you know, stay elevated. So if we're looking here at gold, um, and by the way, I, I do think that if, if we're looking for things to get nasty, I do think things are going to get nasty in three to four years. So just to be clear, I'm not, you know, sticking my head in the sand here. I just thought, I just don't, I just don't think we're there yet for all the reasons that I've said. 
Okay, so one of the most interesting trades right now is gold. So you got this huge monthly squeeze in gold. You can see the last time we had a monthly squeeze here, gold went from about $1,200 an ounce and kissed $2,000 an ounce fairly quickly. I do think that that is a trade that's setting up here again. I'm a huge fan of physical bullion um, for a couple reasons. Um, one, but the main reason is that it's hard to sell physical bullion. I mean, you can do it, but you know, once you, if you buy it and you, you know, you store it somewhere and you hide it, it's kind of a pain to dig it up, run to the store, run to the coin store, run to the gold, gold dealer and sell it. Okay. So, um, meaning that it's easier to hang on for a position trade. It's very difficult to hold on to gold futures for a position trade. Uh, but one way to do something like this is if, you know, you're interested in look at this and go, like, gosh, I think gold could, you know, certainly go much higher. Um, much higher over the near term is, you know, you go over here to GLD and just say, geez, a year from now, is this going to go up? So we're in March, right? So let's go to, let's go to June, uh, June leap 456 days away. So we could get a slightly out of the money call. You know, the premiums are pretty high. You know, I'm not a huge fan of that, but you know, this is something where if gold can end up going to say, um, call it 3,000, so that would be 300, close to 300 on here, then that would pay off. So there's some things like that. And again, my first choice is more physical bullion, uh, but that's something where, you know, you can you can go into the market, into the options market, and buy these longer dated options, and then just kind of sit on them. Yeah, Aaron, I, so here, one of the things too, and a lot of people kind of forget this as well, is what preceded the Roaring Twenties? in the 1920s, it was the Spanish flu, right? It killed like 50 million people worldwide, 1918 to 1920. And what happened after that? The boom, okay? So the boom happened, and of course, how did that end? 2029 crash. I do think we're setting up for something similar there too. I think with the real estate cycle, you know, coming into play at 2026, maybe that happens a little earlier. But remember, there are all the, all the things that were in place for the Roaring Twenties in the 1900s have been in place now. And um, that's not something that, you know, again, I don't think it's quite over yet. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going back to the way things were. Um, if every, you know, I do, I do sense that there's people waiting like, oh, I can't wait till, you know, we get back to where, you know, um, you know, this is Bitcoin, by the way. We can't wait, can't wait till we get back to zero interest rates, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. I don't see that happening. You know, that's not going to, ha that's, that's a, it may not happen again in our lifetimes. So it's just, it's a, you know, important to understand that that was not normal. Over the course of the last few centuries, interest rates have averaged about 4%, right? 0% is an extreme to the downside, and 10% is an extreme to the upside. Yeah, so the other thing here is, the other thing to look at here is, uh, so GE, which I believe they're changing the symbol. So this is kind of the classic recession trade, and this may not really take place till later, like 2026 or so. But the idea with this, this is the best recession trade on planet Earth, because you know this was one that we did with COVID. You know when COVID happened, and it was like, oh my gosh, you know they're going to flood the markets with quantitative easing. I mean this this can't go higher than one to 100, and the options on these are super 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 cheap. So now, like I said, uh, I believe that this symbol has changed for further dated out options. But if you're going to go, say, to June and just say, like, okay, and, and they're pretty liquid, too, and just say, like, okay, wow, I think this, you know, we're going to go into the crapper and, um, you know, we could get, we could see these things go back up to 99, right? It's like, okay, well, what does this look like in terms of a trade? And you could say like, okay, well, I'm going to buy, and you can see there's a lot of open interest and things like that too. It's like, well, I'm going to buy the 98s and then I'll sell the 99s as a debit spread. And, you know, let's say that I do this with, uh, you know, 200 contracts. So I'm going to buy the 98, I'm going to sell the 99. In fact, let's do this with uh, 2,000 contracts just for fun. It's like, oh my God, isn't that a big trade? Well, these are pretty cheap. So you're looking at this where your max loss would be $37,500. I'm not saying, obviously, that's that can be a lot. Uh, but the max profit is almost $5 million. 
Okay, so so that's the re that's the recession trade. So now let's drop this down to 200 contracts. Okay, what does this look like? Oh, okay, I'm I, I'm I'm risking three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars to make almost half a million dollars. Now this trade I don't think has enough time. So it's only 88 days out. But I do think that as we get closer to a 2000, you know, basically the trade here is that the economy goes into the crapper and the Fed starts to cut rates. This is what you do. You buy euro dollar futures. And this is not the currency, not the euro. Okay, that's the currency that trades against the dollar. Euro dollar futures is, is confusing. Um, they're the bond market, essentially. They're the, essentially the short term bond market in Europe. Um, but that's that's the recession trade. So that's you know if 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 things really d do go in the crapper, that's where you're making money. Yeah, it's not General Electric. Yeah. So what happens if our geniuses can't pay the interest on the debt? It, do they inflate it away? Yeah. So so one of the things is, is keep in mind, of course, the debt's never going to get repaid. It's just going to get inflated away over time. Um, also, that the interest rates right now are unsustainable because. Um, uh, and, the, and, and, and the bankers know this. This is not a secret. So, you know, I, and th and these are ballpark numbers, but, you know, we roughly had, if we're talking like 10 years ago, we roughly had $4 trillion in debt, and the annual interest payments were $485 billion a year, okay? Then, when QE interest rates plummeted, and we got like $25 trillion in debt, guess what? The interest payments were $485 billion a year. That's a taxpayer line item. So even they were able to, you know, essentially up the debt six times, but the interest payments didn't change. Okay. Now what happens if those interest payments suddenly go from 485 billion to two trillion a year? Okay. The U.S. government takes in 4.4 trillion dollars in revenue every year. They can't afford that bill. I mean. Because guess what? They'd have to raise the crap out of taxes on everyone. And the reason politicians won't do that is because what? They would get voted out of office. So um, so the idea that interest rates will come down is certainly very real. I think in Powell's mind, he's hoping and praying that inflation so shows signs of abating. And then if the economy goes into the crapper, uh, they can start to cut rates. And that'll also solve that problem. You know the situation that it's in here. It's not. There's nothing that's good about it, right? There's. It's like, wow, this is. Uh, and I think it makes sense to, you know, things like, you know, have some cash out of the bank on hand, have some physical bullion. You know, um, if you want to pay off your house, that's fine too. But just remember, there's a lot of financial things that happen out there that don't necessarily apply to 90% of the population. And so it's easy to kind of think like, oh my God, you know, uh, this is going to happen. It's going to ruin everything. It's not, you know, your balance sheet might suck, um, but that's something that we can prepare for, right? And we just gotta, we just gotta keep it, keep that in mind. Um, yeah, Joe, I'm not sure. I think I saw something. Somebody said they're replacing it with a different symbol. I forgot what the symbol was. It's a Swiss. I think it's some kind of Swiss instrument, but it's the same idea. Yeah, so I'm I'm a fan of Bitcoin, but the main thing to remember with Bitcoin is that it is a speculative asset and it'll only do well in a quantitative easing environment. So here, you know, you kind of forget this, right? Because it's like for a long time, Bitcoin was just kind of hanging out here doing nothing. Now, don't get me wrong. If you bought it at like $200 and it, you know, it popped up to 10000 that's awesome. But when it really found its day in the sun was what? When the Fed exploded quantitative easing. When did it die? When the Fed started quantitative tightening. Guess what happened over the last two weeks? The Fed increased their balance sheet by $300 billion. That's quantitative easing. It is, it is impossible. The Fed knows this. This is their big lever. If they, add, if they throw $300 billion onto the balance sheet, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It goes out and finds its way. It, something's got to offset that, whether in stock prices or you know Bitcoin or whatever. If the Fed throws six trillion dollars on the balance sheet, that six trillion dollars is going to go find its way into assets, and it's going to raise asset prices by six billion dollars. So just remember, quantitative tightening is designed to reel asset prices back in, and quantitative easing is designed to raise asset prices so they can manage the debt levels against all those assets. So that's that's kind of what's going on there. 
Yeah, no, and we can, uh, and you know, and I wanted to talk, so we've talked about for about 30 minutes here on the big picture and, you know, happy to answer a few additional questions, you know, things that we're looking at right now. Um, as you guys know, if we kind of drill down here a little bit, uh, AI is all the rage and I think this is an interesting stock right here. The symbol, oddly enough, is AI. Uh, this is more of a speculative trade, but, um, you know, on this we've got, you know, we've got a squeeze. Um, not the best squeeze, I mean, but you can see that the momentum's heading higher. And, you know, the idea that we can maybe come up and kind of tag that high makes sense. Maybe we break out. So I like that as a speculative, tr as a speculative trade. Um, if we look at Microsoft, uh, this is one, of course, you know, ChatGPT, and they've got exposure to that. Uh, this is one of my favorite stocks in the short term. Microsoft and Apple combined are 13.5% of the S&P 500. And I don't even, I forgot what percentage was they are the NASDAQ. Um, but we do have some, you know, smaller term squeezes setting up here for a little bit shorter term play. But I like the idea that Microsoft can work its way to 286. All right. So this obviously isn't like this huge trade, but it's more, you know, we, we've been, we started buying this one yesterday. But the idea that we could get to 286, we're currently at 280. Now, this isn't a day trade. You know, these are options that we're buying for next week and also April monthlies. Uh, but the idea is that, hey, you know, um, this pattern's very strong. Um, you know, the banks right now are kind of holding the, the S&P 500 back, but this is an individual stock uh, where a target of 286 makes sense. And so I like this. This is a trade I'd add to right now. Um, so that's one that, that's one that I like. Um, you know, oh, is IYR the real estate one? I think it is. iShares... Um, yeah, so this is IYR, I believe is the real estate ETF. So the REITs, you can see they're having a tough time here. And a lot of this is commercial. So commercial real estate is having a tough time here. Okay, thanks. It's, yeah, so commercial real estate here is, you know, that's a mess. So I do think that there's a red flag here in commercial real estate. I do not think it's going to spill over into residential for all the reasons we've talked about. Um, but the problem with real with with commercial real estate in some areas, not all areas, Austin real estate, you can't find an office space like it's it's you know they're occupied. Um, but you know you think about it, there's still people want to work from home. Um, you know it's all that stuff, and it's just it's and and with the uh, and with the higher interest rates there, it's not as attractive. So this is something that's suffering in this in this environment. Um, yeah, IWM. No, I'm not a huge fan of IWM here from on the long side. Why? This is where all the regional banks are. You know, region. Now at some point, regional banks may have a hard bounce. Um, I always look at things this way. If you could only do one trade, like the rest of the week. Do you try to buy or short IWM here? Now, honestly, it looks more like a short or, um, you know, something a little bit cleaner. So I always find that I'd rather just kind of find that one trade that's a little clean. For me, Microsoft is a pretty clean trade. You know, it's 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 leading right now. Uh, there's money kind of pouring into it um, and and all that. OK, so the other the other thing I want to talk about in the short term. So I know we were talking about the big picture and then uh, and then we can wrap up here. But we also want to know, uh, da, 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 let me find this chart if I can find it here. But we also want to know, like, what's happening over the next couple of weeks? And and one of my favorite symbol, this is my favorite chart for that. And what just happened here, that's a one minute chart. We need a daily chart. Okay, so, um, so if we look at this, that's the put call ratio, and let's say we don't necessarily need that right now, um, but I do want to add a, let's see, compare. Okay, SPX. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken uh, the S&P 500 and overlaid it uh, on this. Looks, you know, it'll make sense here in a second. Okay, so why, why, what is important about this? 
And so what I want to show you on this is simply right is right here. So when the put call ratio here, when the put call ratio, this is essentially the combined index and equity put call ratio, when it gets close to one, generally it means there's a big level of panic in the markets and what happens we tend to see bottoms then. Okay, just as when the combined index equity put call ratio gets close to 0.75 or 0.80, there's a lot of confidence in the markets, and that generally leads to a top. Okay, oh here's a here's a bottom. Guess what happened? Everybody was freaking out, right? Um, and then uh, oh my God, it, the world's coming to an end. Everybody's betting that, and then we rally. Okay, so where are we right now? We're we're right here again. So for me personally, I am looking for the markets for the next several weeks to trend higher, okay, until we get this reading down closer to 0 0.80, and at that point, I would be looking to short. Okay, so does that make sense? So for the next couple of weeks, I am looking, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but for the next couple, and it doesn't mean it's going to work, but this has been one of the, my favorite tools. But for the next couple of weeks, I'm generally looking for markets to go higher, led by the NASDAQ, okay, so and if we're, and then and then when we get down to this level just when everybody's getting all bullish that's when we roll over and we die yet again so if we're looking at the ndx um that's a 2 hour chart so if we look here at the ndx on a weekly chart yeah i don't know what's going on there they there's some licensing deal that must have gone that's usually stuff like that is a licensing deal gone wrong when they're when they're no longer supporting it, I'll have to find out. Um, okay, so if we look at a, just a fib retracement here from this swing high uh, to this swing low, and notice the Nasdaq's got a beautiful weekly squeeze here, right? So I the what I'm looking at here is that um, we could actually test, retest these August highs, which is around 13.720 on the Nasdaq, okay? Maybe we don't get there, but that's that's what's teeing up. So what does that mean for the QQQ? Um, that equivalent would be three hundred and thirty-five dollars. Okay, so that's a pretty healthy move from where we are right now. You know, today we're up six points. It doesn't take many six-point moves, right? And, and remember, a lot of people are bearish here, so we're going to get a lot of short covering. Uh, so that's what I'm looking at. Does it mean it's going to work? Of course not. Um, but I'm I am buying the dip until that stops working, and until the squeeze runs out, and until the 10-day moving average of the put call ratio drops to, you know, 0.80 or below. Okay, so that's what I got. Um, let me pause the recording here. I'm happy to hang out, um, but let me go ahead and wrap this up here. You guys have a a uh, fantastic rest of the day, wouldn't be dull, and uh, I will sign off here. Hey, John here with Simple Trading. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, comment down below and let us know what topic you want to see us cover next. Also, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon so you can get notified when we release new videos. And if you want to watch us trade in real time using our own money, go to simplertrading.com and learn how to sign up. Good trading, and we'll see you next time.